I want you to turn with me now, please, to your Bibles. We're turning to the Old Testament, and we're reading from the book of Job this evening, that book that just comes before the book of Psalms. And we're in Job tonight, chapter 33. Job chapter 33. The book of Job chapter 33 and verse 12, please. Job 33 and verse 12. Behold, in this thou art not just, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Let me pause just for a moment. It doesn't say here tonight man is greater than God. Man thinks he's greater than God. Man thinks he's greater than God. I want you to know tonight God is greater than man. God is not answerable to man, but man is answerable to God. My dear unsafe friend, I want you to understand that tonight. One day you're going to stand before God. Whether you like it or not, or whether you believe it or not, but one day you are going to stand before God, and you will be answerable to God. And you won't have a barrister with you. And you won't have a solicitor. And you won't have a minister. You won't have a priest. You'll stand there alone. And mind you, that moment's coming. Man is not greater than God. God's greater than man. You never forget that tonight. Man with all his technology, man with all his brains, man with all that he has, I'll tell you something now, friends, he's nothing. He's nothing in the sight of God. God is greater than man. Verse 13, Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night when deep sleep falleth upon men and slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread, and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyer, destroyers. And if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit, for I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, 
And if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profiteth me not, he will deliver his soul from going down into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God, often times with man. It's not man worketh with God. This is God working with man. Why? Why does God do all this? Verse 30, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he can be enlightened with the light of the living. And we know that the Lord will bless that reading of his own precious truth. I want to commence tonight by quoting the text upon which God's message is based upon this evening. It's Job chapter 33, and it's verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice. God just doesn't only speak once, friends. God often speaks twice. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. That text tonight shows me two things. It shows me tonight man's great, greatest privilege. Do you know what man's greatest privilege is tonight? Man's greatest privilege is a God still speaks to him. Thank God tonight, God still speaks to man. I wonder, has God been speaking to you recently? You've heard his voice. And friend, tonight, I thank God tonight that God still communicates with the human heart, and he still communicates with the human soul. God speaking to man. That's man's greatest privilege. But that text tonight not only speaks of man's greatest privilege, that text tonight speaks of man's greatest problem. Yet man perceiveth it not. God not only speaks once, God often speaks twice, yet man perceiveth it not. What's God trying to say to us? Man's greatest problem is that he's often dull to the voice of the Almighty. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. You see, the heart of man can be so hard, and the heart of man can be so hostile. Man often closes his ears to the pleading to the pleadings of God. My dear unsafe friend, now you listen to me now. Never you close your ears to the voice of God. Four times it's quoted in the Bible. Once in the Old Testament and three times in the New Testament. Psalm 95 verse 7 and 8, Hebrews 3, 7 and 8, Hebrews 3, 15 and Hebrews chapter 4. Today, if ye hear his voice, harden not your heart. My friend, this evening, God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Why does God choose to speak to men? Why does God choose to speak to women? Why does God choose to speak to his friends? Do you want to know why God chooses to speak to us? Because He doesn't want your immortal soul going down into the pit of hell. I 
want you to know that God speaks to us that because God wants to see us saved. God wants to see us in heaven. Do you know tonight God's not willing that any should perish? Do you know tonight God does not delight in the death of the wicked? Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 23, you know what God asks? Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And I mean the wicked. God means the wicked. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God? And not that he should return from his ways and live. See, friend, man, God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not, because man's heart is so hard. And because man's heart's so hard, and because man's heart is so hostile, sometimes when God speaks, friends, He has to speak loud to get us to listen. And in Job chapter 33, you'll find three ways God tries to get through to man. You read Job 33, and the first thing you'll see in verse 15, God often tries to get through to man and speaks to men through dreams. Now let me say this before I go any further. God always speaks to us through His Word. And don't you listen to some cowboy who tells you, I got a dream from God the other night, and the world's going to end in 2015. It's, a, it's definitely true. The fella has been eating too much cheese and onion. I got a dream the other night, and God's going, listen, do you see this Bible? This Bible tonight is up to date right to the very hour. This Bible tells me tonight, and your Bible tells you what's going to happen and what's coming to this world. This Bible's more up to date than the Belfast Telegraph. At least you can believe us in the Bible. Oh no, friends, listen, God often speaks through dreams. Listen to what it says there. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, and hide pride from man. Do you know, friend, tonight, in the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel, you'll find there are five notable dreams. Five times God spoke. Five, time God, five times God warned. Five times God spoke through dreams. Remember in Matthew 27 and verse 19, when Pilate was about to make sentence, there was a wee note slipped up from his mouth, and he said, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. Some of us have heard of a, of a man called Billy Sunday. Have you ever heard of Billy Sunday? Put your hand up if you've heard of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was known as the baseball evangelist. Every time Billy Sunday had a gospel mission, he preached heavily against alcohol. Billy Sunday's two famous sermons against alcohol it was the demon of drink was one of them, and his other sermon was called Lucifer's Liquor. One night Billy Sunday in a big gospel tent crusade, he preached that sermon Lucifer's liquor. And as he preached that night, Billy Sunday with all the power of God upon him said, every time you drink a glass of alcohol, or as he called it liquor in them days, he called it liquor in them days, every time you let a, a, a swallow a glass of liquor, he says, you might as well let the devil put a noose around your neck. Every time you drink a glass of liquor, somebody said, the devil's putting a noose around your neck. 
He said this two or three times, and one man jumped up. He says, Sunday, I don't believe you. And I don't believe your Bible. And I don't believe your God. You're talking nonsense. And he pulled out a bottle of liquor. And he headed out of the temple. I'm way home to get drunk, Sunday. I'm way home to get drunk. Billy Sunday shouted after him. He says, you can do two things. You can let the devil hang you. Or let Christ save you. Oh, he went home that night, this man. And he drunk himself. He could drink no more. He got into bed. And he went to sleep. Ah, but this man began to dream. And he dreamed that night that he was in a hangman's gallows. And the devil came over and he gave him a bottle of whiskey and a glass. And every time he poured a glass in his dream, he, every time he emptied it back, he could see the devil coming over and putting the noose around his neck. Every glass, every time, the devil came and put the, the noose around his neck. Until the time came, there was nothing left in the bottle. And in his dream, he saw the devil walk over to the lever to pull the lever. And as he was to pull the lever, he could hear the voice of Sunday crying after him, Let the devil hang you, or let Christ save you. And that man wakened out of his dream, friend, and got to the side of his bed and asked Christ to save him. Don't tell me God doesn't still speak to dream dreams. There was a notorious Republican gunman back in 1972 and he shot dead a father in front of a six-year-old son. And as the father lay dying on the ground, the gunman went over and his wee lad came over at six and says, please don't kill me, daddy. Please don't kill me, daddy. He emptied the revolver into him. And it never took a fidge of him. Now he was caught. Got life in long cash. Got out in the Good Friday Agreement. And never, never had any remorse to what he'd done until one night in 2001. In his own bed, he dreamed of the incident, and all he could hear was the wee boy's cry, Please don't take my daddy. Please don't kill my daddy. Twenty-nine years after God spoke to him in a dream, and that man was troubled, and that man went, and he spoke to his local Elam pastor and told him all about all that he had done and about how he went to prison. And that Elam pastor led him to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, friend, tonight I can tell you something now. What a mercy it is to be under the restraints of a wake, of a, of a wake conscience. Oh, God has many a man troubled in his sleep. And God often used me to try and get through a man. But you know, friend, sometimes God not only uses dreams, you'll find often God uses disease. God often uses disease. Did you know that? It's actually seen here in verse, verse 19. Now listen to it. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. And the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, that it cannot be seen. And his bones that were not seen stick out. I say that's very familiar, isn't it? That's very familiar. Because man's heart's so hard, and because man's ears are so dull to the pleadings of the Almighty, sometimes God sends disease. It's the only way He can get through to man. I could take you to two people. I can't take you to them tonight because they're in heaven. Dennis Craney was one of them. Godfrey Allen's another man. Them men would never have been saved only for their disease. The Reverend Sam Workman had a mission in a tent outside Rich Hill. 
back in the late 70s, early 80s. My cousin was at that mission. And they call her Olive. And Olive came under deep conviction of sin at that mission, and she went home deeply troubled about her sin, and she was deeply concerned about her soul. And she went home to her husband, Billy, who had no time for the Bible, no time for church. And she sat down in the seat beside him and told Billy that she was going to get saved. You know what Billy says? If you get saved, all of you need me coming through these doors again because you and your religion can go. God doesn't take things like that lately, friends. God doesn't take things like that lately. Six months after that, Billy's mother was dying in the dying in, at home in her bed, and Billy, along with a doctor, was sitting round the bedside. And Billy, the wee cough. <coughs> doctor says, Billy, you need to give them fags up. Says, what fags? I don't smoke. Billy, come in to see me in the morning. I don't like the sound of that cough. You come in and see me in the morning. Billy went in and seen him in the morning. Sounded him out, sent him into hospital. Come back. It's cancer of the lung. Shortly before Billy died, the Marie Curie nurses were helping him over across the bedroom to the wee commode and Billy saw himself in the dressing room table as he walked by. He saw himself. Do you know what he saw? Do you know how he saw himself? Verse 21, his flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out and yea his soul draweth near unto the grave and when Billy saw himself in the mirror that day Billy knew his time on earth was coming to a close he came under conviction and he sent for his minister who was the reverend Dundas And the Reverend Dundas come round to see him and he says, Billy, what's wrong? What's wrong? But he says, Mr. Dundas, look at me. I know I haven't long left and I'm not ready for the hereafter. That day the Reverend Dundas witnessed him. Took him to John 14, verse 6, where it says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And that day, Billy was led to the Lord. And the man that wasn't going to let salvation or anybody getting saved come into underneath his roof was the man who was chastened upon the bed. God sometimes in love God sometimes God in mercy has to put a man and chasten him with pain upon the bed to get through to his heart what does Job say in another portion who hath hardened himself against the almighty and hath prospered now listen to me dear listen to me sir don't leave it that God has to talk to you like this to get you saved. Sometimes God has his own ways of speaking and God has his own ways of getting through And because God speaketh once, and because God speaketh twice, and yet man perceiveth it not, God then takes it further. God will trouble you through dreams, 
And oftentimes God troubles you through disease. My friend, it's because God is merciful. I said to you the other night, I got a phone call from a man called Godfrey, the man I was referring to. He says, George, will you come out and pray with me? Say, oh, well, this is a man I knew. A man I tried to witness to many a times. Oh, he wouldn't listen to me. I'll tell you one thing, he was calling for me that day. Now listen, friends. Never you play hard knack with God. God loves you too much to let you go your own way. Listen, sometimes God will not let a man or a woman go to hell too easily. Because God's love and God's mercy is greater. W.P. Nicholson often said, the only time God will ever get some men to put to to look up is to put them on the broad of their back. Chasing them upon the bed with pain. There's many a man in heaven tonight, and I'll tell you there's many a woman in heaven tonight, and that's how God called them. That's how God spoke to them. He chased them in beds of pain. My friend, has God been speaking? God loves you tonight. Listen, you think that's an awful thing for God to do to get me to listen. Well, you think what it had to take God for you to be saved. And I want to take you for a wee moment now to Calvary's cross. And I want to show you now how God delivered his son into the hands of wicked men to be crucified, to be slain on an old rugged cross so that your immortal soul, unsafe friend, that is chained by sin and shackled by sin, could be set free. Friend, does death tonight not scare you? Cancer scares us all, but death should scare us. Hell should scare us. And God loves you so much, my dear unsafe friend, that he delivered his only begotten sinless son into the hands of wicked men to be crucified to an old rugged cross. And he didn't die for Protestants. And he didn't die for Catholics. He died for lost sinners such as you or me. And I'm pleading with you tonight, friends. Gaze upon Calvary's cross tonight and see the love of God for your immortal soul. Because on that cross He suffered and bled and died to take your place. He did. And He died and His blood was shed. Bill, he said it here tonight. I preached on it the other night. The worst, cancer of kill the worst killer of killers is sin. But thank God the remedy for sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Hallelujah. Past, present, and future. There's something penicillin can't do. It's something chemotherapy can't do. It's only the blood of Christ. And tonight you can be set free, and not only set free, praise God, you can be cleansed. Come now, he says. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well. Tell me that. Is that not music to your ears? To know tonight, your sins could be forgiven. He died to set you free. He's not on the tree tonight, thank God. He's not on the tomb. He's on the throne. And the marks of Calvary still upon them too. Now listen, friends. God speaketh once, aye, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth not. And my friend, God does go further to get through it. He takes the step, perhaps troubling men with dreams. And he can waken men through disease. 
but he often sends disciples. Take a wee look and with this I'm finished. Verse 23, If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down into the pit. Now what does that mean if there be a messenger with him? You know who a messenger is? A messenger is a person that God has totally gifted in a powerful way to make the gospel message as simple and as clear as possible. Now, I, I don't know about you. So, Bill, you, you'll probably agree with me. You when you're preaching some Sunday, you see the odd head going down. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I don't see too many in Kilkee. That'd be the odd one. <laughs> and the head goes down. And then they get a wee wake and, oh, he's near finished yet. Oh, my, he's not half hour to go yet. And you know what that's like, don't you? And you ask them, you know what I preached on? I needn't be asking you because I, sometimes I half time, I can't remember what I preached on either. But then somebody else comes. There's two men. I would refer them as men, they're now in heaven, as God's real messenger. Sammy Workman was one of them, Ivan Thompson was the other. And no matter how hard you were against the gospel, friend, you drunk every word them men said, and they just made it so clear. And God sends men like that into the community to make it clear, to make it simple, to make it understandable, to make it into my language so that you could be saved. But my friend tonight, is it possible God speaks to you just now where you are? The friend, tonight sin does trouble you. And death troubles you. And eternity troubles you. And meeting God troubles you. My friend, if you're troubled, do you know what that means? That means God speaking. If you're walking out of this meeting tonight and saying that big boy's and he was not an only and he get he danced about that platform, that, that's when you should worry. Because that means God's not speaking. But if you're sitting there and you're thinking, boy, well that man's telling me he's troubling me, listen, it's not George McConnell that's troubling me. It's God the Holy Spirit. Woe to the man or woman that sits in this meeting and you're not concerned. You should be concerned if you're not concerned. And all I want to say tonight is this. Come to my blessed Savior. He won't turn you away. He's the Savior of all sinners. And tonight he said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am come, he said, to seek and to save that which is lost. He says, I have come into this world to save sinners. And tonight he has come, not only to speak with you, but to save your never dying soul. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, Yet man perceiveth it not. Tell me, love, do you hear his voice? Friend, don't reject, respond. And come to me, who alone can save the soul, forgive sin, and fit us for heaven and for hope. Let's take a wee moment now in the stillness of these moments and the quietness of these moments. I want every head bowed and I mean bowed down low and I want every eye closed and I want God's people to pray. Is there anybody here tonight and you're troubled? God has really been speaking. And there's that burden upon your heart tonight. That fear within your soul. And tonight you're concerned. Well, 
That hasn't come from me, that comes from God. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And if you hear His voice tonight, all I can say to you is this, you must open your heart's door tonight and trust the Savior in repentance of sin. You may say to me, you know, God has been speaking. But I'm going to leave it, friend, never you leave. God never guarantees tomorrow. He always calls today. And friend, tonight, don't leave this tonight. God has been merciful to you to spare you to this very moment and to speak to you. Friend, you trust him tonight. There's a wee caravan just outside there. And if you'd like to speak to me, listen, just say to me at the door, George, I want to speak to you. And if someone tonight has brought them with you, brought you with them, listen, they'll come with you. But don't go home tonight, friends. Don't leave us. The time that you're guaranteed is the time you have now. Not one minute later. God has been speaking to you and God has been straight. And all I want to plead with you now is come to Christ and be saved. Before. Before it's forever too late. I trust that you will. Let nothing or no one put you off. You come tonight. You come now. Lord, in the stillness of these moments, give the saving grace. And in spite of fears within and without, help, Lord, these lovely folk to come and to put their trust in me. And, Lord, to start for heaven tonight, I pray in my Savior's name. Amen.